I'm going to talk about uh, Snow Hatter, uh, who we are, uh, how we work, and obviously show you some of the things we do. So the title for my lecture really is People, Process, and Projects, but I see I'm supposed to talk about landscape as well. So maybe I won't talk too much about landscape, and you can ask me about it later, or maybe it'll just shine through. So Snow Hatter is behind me. Snow Hatter is, of course, uh, a mountain. I'm sure you all knew that before. But it's not a man. That's the most important thing. Uh, it's not the name of any one person. It's a mountain. It's the second biggest mountain in Norway, third biggest mountain in Norway. Doesn't matter. It's not a person. Because architecture is so much more complicated than one person. So if you go out there and you start your own practices, don't call it after your own name or your friends' names. Find some other name, like Stroka or something. So we have, uh, we have projects uh, all over the world. We started off uh, in 89 with our very first project, and that was an open competition where we won the Library of Alexandria project. And that was, we were then just students, uh, we hadn't built anything, so we started already with a big building way off on the other side of the world. So we've continued doing that, building across the world. Fortunately, there's one point missing there, and that's uh, Moscow. So I've now had to add a red dot on Moscow because we're now working with Stroker on one of their projects on the Garden Ring. So we're very happy about that, that there now is a red dot in Moscow. Would be our first, when it's finished, our first project in Russia. And so it's people. We have really, uh, we spread out, but we have one office. That's our main office. That's where I come from, and that's in Oslo and Norway. So even though we're working around the world, uh, we really come from Norway. We're Norwegians. I'm not Norwegian, but we're Norwegians. Our roots are in Norway. You know, it helps... Um, because I think you can see on the map that Norway is a very long way away. It's like on the edge of everything. It's on the periphery. Uh, and that helps us a lot, I think. We come from the outside looking in. We're not coming from the center exporting our culture out. So when we travel around the world, we're the ones who are coming from the outside. We're the ones who want to learn about the culture and the place that we come to. So coming from the periphery is not a bad thing. I think Moscow must be in the middle, though. So we have some small offices around the world. We have an office in uh, New York, so that's now become quite big. So they've really grown. There are about 50 people in New York. We're 100 people in uh, Norway. And then we have some small satellites. So we have uh, five people out in San Francisco. We have one person in Singapore. And we have two lucky people in Australia. So these are sort of satellites that maybe we can grow from. So the first word on the title, people, process and projects, is people. And I suppose people is the most important thing. Architecture is, after all, about people. It's not really about buildings. Buildings are just the result of what we do. Uh, but it's really about people, um, many people. Uh, people who use the buildings, people who design the buildings, people who pay for the buildings. Uh, you cannot be an architect without engaging in people. So we're very concerned about our people, uh, who they are, how they have their life, and uh, how we interact with all the people around the project, the stakeholders, the clients, the dialogue that we can get into. So these are some of our people. Um, there's no real uh, common denominator uh, around our people. Uh, we come from all over the world. Unfortunately, at this current point of time, there are no Russian people at Snow Hatter, so we should have to try and change that quickly. But uh, we have people from all around the world. Uh, people tend to uh, stay at Snow Hatter. Uh, so uh, we don't, um, when we employ people, they tend to stay. So they keep on 
staying at the office. So we, we're not as young as we used to be. Actually, we're getting a little bit older. Maybe we're older than we think we are. Um, but fortunately, because we're growing, we can still bring in new people. So um, this is a, a map I made some years ago of our office. And uh, it's some years ago because there's not 100 dots there. But if you can imagine, each of those dots is uh, an architect. Then our office is a very simple space, a little bit like this space here. It's one floor, four walls, and a roof. And that's the only way we could imagine having an office. It's a flat floor. It's a level playing field. And we think we have a very flat structure. So we, uh, I'm going to show you now how we organize our teams. Or maybe disorganize is probably the right word. So this is my disorganizational map of Snohetta. So what we don't do is we don't build uh, pyramids with directors at the top and small directors underneath that and then other smaller directors underneath that. We try to keep it very flat. And every project has its own group. So there's the red group and the green group and the yellow group. And we all are mixed up. So if you're working on the red project, one thing you can know for sure is that you will not be sitting next to anybody else who's working on the red project. You'll be sitting next to someone who's working on the yellow project or the green project or the blue project. The idea is that that means we all have to talk. We all have to walk across the space to talk to other people working on our project. We have to go into dialogue. We have to learn from each other. So if I'm sitting working on one project, the person next to me has all sorts of other projects, all sorts of other problems, and I learn from those things that are going on. So we mix it up. So there are not supposed to be any straight lines, only uh, long, curvy, difficult lines. So that means that you get this sort of a landscape. Well, you've probably seen that sort of thing in many offices. But we all sit as close as we possibly can, as little distance as possible, so that we can actually talk to as many people as we possibly can and meet as many people as we possibly can. So that's the work end of the office. And then at the other end of the office, it's the social end of the office. So this is where we have our parties, our dinners, our meetings, and it's just full of sofas and tables. And these are maybe the four most important corners of the office. So on the uh, top right, that's the coffee machine. No architectural office works without a coffee machine. And if I want to know anything about any of the projects that are going on in the office, then the best place for me to stand is at the coffee machine, uh, certainly not sitting at my desk. Uh, there I'll meet everybody, and everyone will tell me everything about what's going on. Uh, and then uh, on the top left, it looks like there's nothing going on there, but that's the... Uh, the dinner table, that's where we all have our big um, meetings. There uh, seems to be a meeting going on now. And in the middle of the day, that's where we have our lunch. So we have our lunch together. So we have a cook. She cooks for 80, 90 people every day. And she smiles, and that's fine. And it keeps us all together. It makes the, us uh, talk to each other. It makes us meet each other and not go away with our lunch boxes somewhere. And then on the bottom left here, we have our steps. I'm really impressed and proud of our steps. It's where we have our Monday meetings and our gatherings. But then compared to your steps you got here, it's nothing. But this is where we uh, all get together uh, and uh, have Monday meetings, where we talk about the work that's going on and what we're going to do the next week. So to do all these things, these social things, talking, drinking coffee, having meetings, having lunch, we have to have the robot who works 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, in the back room doing all the work so that we can just keep drinking coffee and uh, talking. So the last word, or well, the middle word, is process. Uh, I think that's probably the most important word. Obviously, you need good people to have a good process. But you can be sure that if you don't have a good process, you will never have a good building. Uh, I don't think you can have good architecture if you don't have a good process behind it. Sometimes it's as important uh, how you do things as what you do. I think that that's something that we think a lot about, that the way in which we build a building, create a building, 
has a lot to say about how that building is turning out and how that building is perceived by the people who are going to use it and, uh, and live with it. So we put a lot of effort into process. Uh, so the first step is not to design the building, it's to design the process. So we, uh, we had, a, uh, we had a, a group of social anthropologists who came from the university to study us, and they made a little book about us. It's called Idea Works here. You can go and buy it. And in the book, they've written down all of the uh, creative drivers that they found uh, within our office. Ooh. Technical hitch. Okay, fingers crossed, uh, we continue. So uh, these are some of the um, creative drivers, as they call them, that they thought that we, how we worked. So things like um, generative resistance, that we are critical to what we're doing, daring to imagine, activating drama, zooming out and zooming in. So we use some of these things quite directly. We've invented a word, and we call it transpositioning. It's nothing to do with transdressing, it's transpositioning. So we swap roles. You know, we're multidisciplinary, and um, multidisciplinary has been around a long time, but it doesn't really help if you're multidisciplinary if you don't uh, actually find a way of working together. So we have architects and we have landscape architects, we have interior designers and graphic designers, but by uh, transpositioning, we try to swap roles so that architects speak like interior architects and interior architects can talk about plants and landscape and, uh, and grass and things. So by swapping roles, we mean that people can't hide behind their own uh, specialists. So they can't come and say, I'm the landscape architect. I know how things should be. Uh, you actually, uh, everyone speaks with the same voice. Everyone um, is equally important, whatever discipline you come from. And we try and bring our clients into this too. So when we introduce our clients to the project and at the worst, first workshops, then we try and ask the client to be the architect and uh, we try and be the client. So these are uh, just some more of the uh, creative drivers, liberating laughter. You know that architecture is uh, deadly serious. We uh, deal with the large sums of money and politics and power. So uh, actually being able to laugh, and not just a laugh ha-ha, but really laugh out loud, is really an important part of working together in a team. If you can't laugh about it, you're not going to get very far. Rapid prototyping. We now have a lot more tools in our toolboxes than we have before. Uh, and we think architecture is changing as we start to use those tools. So to be able to rapid prototype your ideas by using computer-driven milling machines or printing, printing in 3D or whatever it is you're using adds a whole new dimension to our work. Um, when you only have a very hard, thin pencil to draw on a piece of film, that gives you one sort of aesthetic. If you have a soft 
pencil that you can spread out on the page gives you a different sort of aesthetic. And if you can use this sort of machine to design your building, it will give you another aesthetic. So it's really choosing the tools that you have available to design the buildings is going to change the aesthetics of how we design. And then getting physical. Well, one thing is actually going out and visiting the top of the mountain. This is one of our trips to Snowheader. It's an yearly pilgrimage, but it's not really that sort of getting physical I'm thinking of. It's uh, getting ourselves out from the screens. We have these wonderful screens these days, but uh, we get dragged and sucked into the screen. We want to bring our designers out of the screen, put things on the wall, make it physically, and talk about the physical things. And we want to bring our clients into our work workshop. These are sophisticated clients from Manhattan. These are less sophisticated clients from Australia. But these are not architects, but these are uh, administrators. These are the clients. And we try to get them to build the building as well. It's really quite a good trick because it gives this idea of um, personal ownership to the project. If your client has actually built the project himself, made the model, then you bet damn sure he's going to build it. Building big scale, large scale models, and getting the clients to uh, take part in that. We put them, uh, we give them aprons to put on, and they go into the workshop and get dusty and dirty, just like us. And um, it's something quite different for people who are used to having ties and suits and being uh, clients. So I'll show you some of, uh, some of the projects. Uh, and I have to start really with our first project, which was uh, in Alexandria in Egypt. This is the Library of Alexandria. It was uh, an open competition in 1989. There are not many uh, open competitions anymore. It's sort of gone out of fashion. Um, but this was an open competition. And the great thing about an open competition is you never know who's going to win. You never know who you're going to get. And the client in Egypt certainly had no idea they were going to get us. This was our first job. We hadn't built anything before. We had long hair, jeans with holes, and we were invited to the um, prize-winning ceremony in Alexandria by the clients, and they were all lined up in their suits and their ties, and they got a shock when they saw who it was they'd chosen to build their building. Oh, it's hippies. We've chosen the hippies. But uh, they were a really great client, and they stuck with us all the way through. They could have chosen somebody else. They could have just kicked us out, but they actually stuck through and built the building. Uh, Alexandria is a very special place. It's very close to my heart. I lived there for many years as we built the library. Um, two generations ago, it was the multicultural capital of the Mediterranean. It was the biggest multicultural city on the Mediterranean. All that changed after the war and the revolution. But some of the architecture is still there. The Greeks, the Italians, the French, the Jews, they all live there. And our building is very special. It's not really a building, I think. I think it really is a landscape. So this is where I maybe start to talk about landscape. Uh, it doesn't interact with any landscape, but I think it is a landscape. From the back, it's a big rock, so it's this 30-meter-high uh, wall circulating around, and it's all carved out of the solid granite. Now, on the wall, you will find hieroglyphs and letters of every alphabet in the history of mankind. I think, I'm sure, you will find Russian. I don't quite know where the Russian is. So next time I go to Alexandria, I'll find out where the Russian is. But every sort of uh, alphabet is on the, on the wall. Now, this was cut out of the solid stone by um, Egyptian uh, carvers. We had to take them to the quarries of Norway to learn some of the techniques again of cutting by hand, not cutting by saws or cutting by machines. So it's all hand cut. It's a fantastic uh, piece of art. And then on the... Mediterranean side facing the sea itself is this great roof that dives out of the sea, out of the lake, and up into the sky. So this is the, the roof. It's really the high-tech 
part of the building. So on the back, the stone is the same technology as Alexander himself could have built the library out of one stone on the next stone. This was the first, first use of honeycomb aluminium panels. The roof lights are all on the diagonal, so they are looking directly to the north, so that you don't get any of the sunlight into the um, library. You just get the view. So when you sit in the library behind here, you can sit, read a book, and you can look out over the Mediterranean. Uh, you know, libraries are about much more than uh, reading books. I don't think actually the books are really so important. I think libraries are a place to meet other people in. They're a place to uh, be alone in together. And certainly this library is uh, an amazing space to be in. It is really like a landscape. It's got seven layers as they go down. It's like a terraced hillside. It's... Uh, the acoustics are really quite sharp, so that if you drop a pencil, you can hear it. But that makes it really quite interesting, because people then are quiet, rather than making a noise. And as you sit on each of the levels, you can look out through the windows and see the sea. And then the columns, they're like the tree trunks, and the canopy of the roof lets the light dapple through. <coughs> so when you go out, into the library, it's not like going out into a room. It's like going out outdoors. You feel like you're going into an outdoor space. And it sits uh, in the, uh, the landscape of Alexandria actually quite nicely. It doesn't stick up, but it's a landmark. It's a horizontal landmark. It's quite interesting because the mayor of Alexandria hates modern architecture, but he loves this building. I think that's because he doesn't really see it as a building. For him, it's really an object. It's a landscape. So he worked a lot in Alexandria about getting a big public space around the library. And it was a big effort because the Egyptians, they really didn't want a public space. Because in public spaces, well, all sorts of things can happen and they can't have control. But we worked a lot and we designed this beautiful plaza around the library and the first thing the client wanted to do was to put up a fence around the um, plaza because then he could keep the people out. He made this beautiful plaza. Fortunately, he didn't build a fence and now, and particularly during the revolution, these shots are taken during the revolution a few years ago, it's become the place where people meet when they need to be heard and they need to be together. So they're not praying to the building. I think they're praying to Mecca. Um, and even during the revolution, made a human chain around the building to stop the looters from coming in, taking the books. I think this is really what we mean about public space. It's space the public feel that they own. The citizens of Alexandria feel this is their space and they own it. So I'll jump in time and size and show you one of the smallest buildings we've done. Often it's the smallest buildings that are the most known. Uh, so this, this building has actually gone around the world, uh, but it's really a very tiny building. So size doesn't matter if you're an architect. Um, small can also be very, very big. And this building is a little pavilion on our own mountain, on the Snowheta mountain, and it's the wild reindeer pavilion, so it's the place where small school children can go and watch the very dangerous uh, wild animals of Norway safely. Uh, so this is a muskus um, on, the, on the mountain and the kids can go inside our little building and they look towards our mountain, so this is actually Snowheader Mountain, so it's like going home for us. And then inside here they can close the door so that the wild animals can't get them, and they can look and see safely the wild animals. So it's a tiny little building, but it's gone all the way around the world. It's uh, extremely important for us to have both small buildings and large buildings going on at the same time. If you only build big projects, then you're going to get very boring after a short while, because big projects take such a long time. So the Library of Alexandria, that took 13 years to build. They don't tell you this when you go to architecture school, that architecture takes so long time. Um, but it really does. Uh, 
poets can write a poem in a day or an artist can paint a painting in a day and a writer can write a book in a week maybe but architecture takes a long long time so to have small projects that go very fast gives you input and uh, a new dynamic so I'll show you a little bit about how we designed this project. Obviously, as you all designed your buildings today, we did it in a 3D model in CAD, of course. Uh, and then taking the 3D model and then using directly our, um, our robot. So it, again, I don't think you needed the robot to design this building. You obviously could have designed this building in any, uh, any other way. But by using the technology and using a different technology, I think you get a different aesthetic. So we could then just go directly from the screen into the robot and make this thing in three dimensions. It's really, I think, a fantastic possibility that we can now go directly into the physical dimension. And we didn't have this a few years ago. So that's the model that we made. The reindeer is in the wrong place. He's supposed to be on the outside. And then we took the same model up to the guy who was going to really build it. He actually made his, makes boats. So you can see his boat at the back there. And he glued together. Well, he didn't glue together. But he put together all the logs and um, used exactly the same computer model that we used in our workshop and built the building in one piece using his uh, computer milling machine. Um, but this ability to work in one-to-one -one is something we've never really had before. Yes, you could make mock-ups, but mainly we just made drawings and diagrams and gave them to other people to, to build. But the ability to build it in one-to-one, -one, I think, changes everything. It means you are really more working like an artist directly and not just making diagrams. So that's the finished building. Um, it's open, it's an open door structure. Anyone can come anytime, go in and uh, watch the building, watch the annals, keep them safe. It struck me uh, since I've been in Moscow that the uh, landscape in Moscow is very different to the landscape in Norway. Um, so our landscape goes like up and down, but uh, yours is pretty flat. Um, so we struggle with our landscape. I don't think we design buildings that are integrated into the landscape. This is a hotel, by the way, up in the north of Norway, uh, on the Lofoten Islands, where the landscape is really dramatic. I think we make architecture that um, contrasts the landscape, but maybe architecture that, in its essence, is landscape. And landscape follows us all around the world. So our biggest project that we've been building lately is in Saudi Arabia, in the desert of Saudi Arabia. So it's this project here. It's the Saudi Aramco King Abdullah Aziz Center for World Culture is its title. Uh, it's a cultural center. We had a, a lot of discussion, I think, in the office when we first were asked to take part in this project whether we really wanted to work in Saudi Arabia, whether we thought that Saudi Arabia was a place where we could front our ideals, which often seem to be in conflict with the culture of the place. It's a, it's a discussion we've continually had uh, and continually have. I think our answer to that is that by doing this building, if we can make a good step towards something that is better, if we can make a building that can help the reform that is going on in the country at that time happen, then it's a good thing, and we would like to be a part of it. So this is a cultural center, and they don't have cultural centers as the way that we know cultural centers in the West. So it has a library, it has a theater, a cinema, a museum, it's everything all rolled into one. And the nice thing about doing that in Saudi Arabia is that they don't have buildings like that before. So you can do a building that nobody has ever seen before. There is no archetype for this building down there. Uh, we designed the building as a series of rocks that sort of support each other. So if you saw the image there, 
Each of the components, the theater, the library, each has its own shape. And they're put together in such a way that they support each other a little bit like a Roman arch. I think this was a really smart move because it means that the client, who in this case is the Saudi Aramco oil company, has to build the whole of the project. He can't choose to build this part or this part. He has to build all of the parts because they support each other. They support each other physically. Uh, so if you take one piece away, then the other piece falls down. And uh, the idea is that if you take away one piece of culture, then the rest of culture falls down too. So you need to embrace all of culture if you're going to build a cultural center. And that's what they've done. It's, uh, it's a very strange building. I, I, um, I think it's amazing every time I see it. How did we ever do anything like this? How could anyone ever build anything like this? They're very really quite complicated shapes. They're two double curved forms. So we had to think a lot about how we could cover a double curved shape in the most simple way. And the most simple way is a line. So it's like a piece of string. If you put a piece of string around something, you can wrap it quite easily. You just have to bend it in one direction. So our cladding has been now developed as a series of uh, pipes, tubes, that are wrapped around these uh, different shapes. So from our models, then, you see that each of the shapes starts getting quite complicated patterns, really just like the pattern you have on your thumbprint. So you really just start wrapping. It doesn't matter where you start, and the pattern will just develop itself, which is quite nice, because that means we don't have to design the pattern itself. And then to build this, can't start the film. Hmm. I don't see the cursor to click on the film. Oh, you do it there, okay. It doesn't matter. We can jump over it. Yeah? Okay, sorry about the technology, but this is the technology that we're then using to uh, bend these pipes. So, <clears throat> two machines like this, uh, somewhere in Germany, uh, then bending all of the pipes. So each of the pipes is obviously modeled in our model. It has a particular radius. And then the machine um, bends each of the pipes to just the right radius. They put a little number on it, move it to the side, and then they build up the whole cladding. So I really wish we had a machine like this at our office, but unfortunately we don't. I think we'd have it going all the time. It's quite therapeutic just to see. Then that's the prototype we've had up for a while. That's the rendering, and now this is how it's looking on site in Saudi Arabia now. So you see some of the uh, patterns that just developed because you're trying to wrap this, this object. So that's the keystone you really can't take away. It falls down. 
really just like your thumbprint. And then on the inside, you see some of these shapes breaking into the spaces. And the inside is dig dug down into the sand. So we use the actual sand that we dig out of the earth to make these rammed earth walls. So we just ram those into um, shuttering to make the earth walls. Where we get to windows, and we probably don't have too many windows, uh, we flatten the tubes so they get squashed, so they become like uh, blinds. And this is the way it looks about now on site. It's almost finished. Uh, later this year, it should be finished. So if any of you are lucky enough to get a visa to go and visit Saudi Arabia, you could go and see the building. It's a pity that it's so difficult to go and see. So what we're looking down now, looking down the tower to the roof of the library, and around here we see the landscape. So the landscape is a, what we call a zeri scape. So it's only plants that grow in the desert naturally. So as you can see, it's not very green. It's going to be a little bit more green than that, but it's not going to be very green. So there's almost no irrigation, only desert plants and rocks around. And then we've had to have our architects down there, of course. Uh, so these are two of these are our architects. I think this is part of the discussion, how easy is it to work in Saudi Arabia? If the Saudi Arabians had said, you cannot send uh, ladies, you cannot send women to work on the site, then we would have said no to the job. Uh, it's certainly not an easy situation to be an architect and wrap yourself up in uh, that close. So back in Europe, we do do a lot of uh, small jobs as well. This is uh, in Oslo, and we work for the um, Airsop company. They, are, uh, they do uh, skin products. They're based in Australia, but they build shops all over the world. So they've used us for a couple. This is one in Oslo itself. Um, really quite nice projects to work with. There is their um, philosophy of building stores is to make sure that each store is unique. So they're all totally different, but they're all based around the same theme, the same philosophy. So this is our Oslo store. Uh, we just done one in Singapore, in Brass, and one in Berlin, just opened recently in wood. Again, these are these small projects that can go very quickly. In the course of a few months, you've made a project, and you've built it, and you can learn from the process. In Austria, we've been working with uh, Sparowski. Um, they make those glass things, and they have this incredible thing called the Kristall uh, Welten. So it's like a Swarovski theme park down there in Austria. So uh, I don't think I go there so much, but uh, they asked us to do a few projects there, and this one is a fun one. So it's a, it's a play tower. So they wanted a playground, but they wanted it as a tower so that you could uh, experience the beautiful landscape in Austria. So this is like taking all the functions of your playground and stacking them on top of each other. So you have the uh, trampoline and the bouncy bed, uh, and you can bounce up and down and see the mountains. I think this is our, these are kids, but this is our staff, big kids. It's not often we get to build projects in uh, Oslo itself, so the opera was uh, one of the exceptions. Again, just like in Alexandria, this was an open competition. Uh, there were 600 competitors, um, we were lucky enough to win it. So. We do a lot of projects, a lot of competitions, and uh, you'll be happy to know that we lose most of the competitions we take part in. But some of the most important buildings we've ever built have been done through competitions. So it's not about which projects you lose, it's which projects you win that's really important. I think our statistic is about one in 10 winning. So 10 failures, one win. The opera was a, was a win. It's a great project to do in Norway because Norwegians really don't like the opera. I think there's some Norwegians here now, but uh, that's my, uh, that's my uh, statement. 
Norwegians really don't like the opera. The opera is an elitist institution, and Norway, Norway is based on very good, sound, social democratic values. We uh, like to share, and we don't like elitism. So the opera has always been seen as an elitist uh, institution, snobby institution. So uh, how do you design an opera in Oslo? Well, actually, you let people jump up and down on it so that they feel that they own it, and they feel it's their opera. And um, that's what we did. Luckily, there wasn't any space around the building for a plaza, so we put the plaza on the roof. And that means that people can walk all over the roof, and they do. They go for their Sunday walks, they take their dogs, they take their families, they take their picnics, they take their, their grandparents. Every day, even in the worst of the winter, there's always people there. It might be raining, it might be snowing, you can go skiing there if you want. Everyone's there. And people feel that they own it. If you can jump up and down on it, if you can touch it, you own it, it's yours. It's your opera. So people love the opera. And because they love the opera, they've now become to love going to the opera too. So it's quite difficult to get tickets these days. Kids climbing all over the entrance, and then on the inside. We worked a lot with artists on most of our big projects, and this one is, is really no exception. So this is uh, one of the light sculptures done by Olaf Eliasson. He's an Icelandic Danish artist. So they change color slightly, slowly, gradually during the evening, re changing the pace of your experience. You've come from the busy city into the foyer, and these lights just go very slowly up and down changing your pace of perception. Then the, the wooden wall divides the foyer from the theatres themselves, so the everyday life to the unreal life inside the theatre. It's all made of wood, so as you uh, enter the theatre itself, you go inside this wooden world. It's like going inside a tree. The floor is wood, the ceiling is wood, the handrail is wood. You're inside this uh, tree, and then you come out into the theater itself. It's a horseshoe. It's a classical uh, opera. Uh, we don't have special seats for the king, so the king of Norway is sitting in the middle there. Very social democratic. Uh, there's a lot of art inside the hall, too. So this is the um, stage curtain, and it's made by a textile artist from California called Pei White. And she, um, she's woven this cloth. Uh, it looks like it's made out of crumpled aluminium, but it's not. It's completely flat. It's made of silk in grays and blacks and whites. There's no silver in it. If you go up close, it looks like this. You stand back a few meters, and it looks like this. So it's illusion, just like the opera is itself. If you look at the plans of the opera, the actual auditorium itself is really rather small, and the building is really rather huge. So the rest of the building is all this backstage machine that's there to make this performance happen. So it's the workshops, it's the rehearsal halls, and the, uh, uh, and the dressing rooms. And we put those all the way around the outside so that you can look out to the street and see what's going on inside. So these are the painting workshops. And then the, the, the roof itself. We had the... We had a big argument with the authorities about the roof. There's a few things that were wrong with it. It's um, obviously far too steep, so it doesn't conform to any building regulations. So to get permission to build the roof and have people walking on it, we had to define it as not a building, not a roof, but a piece of art. So the roof is a piece of art, because if it's art, you can do what you want. The other problem we had is that we really wanted to build it out of marble, white Carrara marble. The reason we wanted to use white Carrara marble is that if you've ever been to Oslo in November, it's the darkest, dullest place in the world. Uh, there is no light. But if you go to November onto the roof of the opera, it still shines, it's bright and it glows. And if you go in the summer, you should definitely have sunglasses. So to get permission to use the Italian marble, we had to go all the way up to the parliament. And it was debated and discussed in the parliament if we were allowed to use Italian stone rather than Norwegian stone. Luckily, it's mainly Italian. So the steps, 
it just uh, are all cut out of the solid. So the whole roof is actually a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. There are 50,000 separate pieces. Each of the pieces is unique. Um, they're taken from the 3D model, and then they're machine cut by a computer machine. So that this step is not made up of tiles, it's cut from the solid. So these are from the, um, the stone quarries in Carrara. And, and, and this is the roof in Oslo. It is a piece of art. It actually is worked on by artists. The whole roof itself is a composition. There are small steps. There are gullies for the water to run down through. And uh, sometimes it's used for a lot of people. So this is actually 7,000 people who didn't get tickets for the um, showing of Carmen on the inside. They got to see it on the screen on the outside. It's also a place to be alone in. Feeding the ducks with your family, fishing. So all sorts of things have gone on there and all sorts of things that we didn't think about. So this guy uh, even takes his motorbike there. When we were building it and designing it, everyone said this is not going to work because there's going to be so many skateboarders. And uh, you're going to have skateboarders over the whole roof of the opera and it's going to be terrible. In fact, the skateboarders really don't like it for some reason. I don't know why they don't like it. Maybe it's too rough, maybe it's too simple, too obvious. Um, so there's never any skateboarders there. But sometimes you get guys like this. Uh, we hadn't actually imagined the motorbike. but it's not allowed. So they chase you away. But if you're on a motorbike, they're not going to catch you. And then on the other side of the world, we just opened this building, which is in San Francisco, and it's the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. So uh, the building in the foreground is, of course, not our building. This is the original SF MoMA building of Mario Botta. It was built in the 80s. It's one of his best buildings, I think. Uh, really much loved by the San Franciscans. And so our task was to double the size of the museum, and how do you possibly uh, build on to a building like that. So we really had to detach it and say that Mario Botta could be Mario Botta and Snow Header could be Snow Header. So they're like two dancing partners. They're very different dancing partners, uh, but they're different. They play together. So the, the main building is all the way at the back. It has a new entrance. And I think it's this facade that's the most interesting part of it from the outside. It, again, is trying to bring a little bit of nature, I think, into the building. So it's this huge facade that's built a little bit like a cliff. So each of the panels, they're concrete, glass fiber reinforced concrete panels. They're individually cast, so they each have their own separate mold. The mold is cut on a um, robot like our robot, but into foam, so that that's quite cheap to do. Uh, and then they're all mounted up together. So it becomes this uh, natural wall in the middle of San Francisco. The uh, gallery is absolutely stunning, and the works of art are stunning. So this is the Richard Serra sculptures, which had to be moved in long before the building was finished because they're so big. This is the mock-up we made of the galleries, and this is just before it was completed. It's now been opened, so if you go to San Francisco, you must make a trip. And staying in New York, and I think this is quite relevant, maybe to some of the work that uh, Strelker is doing in um, Moscow. This is our project in uh, Manhattan for Times Square. So this is not as big as the garden ring that Strelker is building, but it's quite a large scale project. So it's pedestrianizing the whole of Times Square. So that's uh, six blocks. Uh, along uh, 7th Avenue, at the junction between 7th Avenue and Broadway. So because of the grid of New York and the angle of Broadway, all of these junctions have been absolutely impossible junctions in history. So the traffic jams and the traffic queues have been terrible. So the mayor did a study of the traffic potential, and just by closing Broadway over those six blocks, you actually improved the traffic situation because you cut out these terrible junctions. 
And it gave us then the opportunity to make this new amazing public space in the middle of Manhattan and for people in Manhattan to experience Times Square without standing in the middle of a highway, which is what they've done all through history. So it's a really quite fantastic project. It's urban space, it's pedestrianization, it's, uh, this is the way Times Square was, and this is a rendering, but it is the way it is now. Um, very simple spaces, we can't do very much there because uh, it's a place where people want to have their parades, so we can't have lots of furniture or trees or plants. It's one big uh, stone granite surface. There are benches to sit on, but it's a place where big numbers of people can gather. Uh, this is when we were trying out some of the benches. Uh, it's looking at how, no, how New Yorkers use their space. Um, we're not very popular right now down in Manhattan because it's been absolute chaos at Times Square as they've been building it um, with the traffic jams and the, and the building work. But um, the last piece is being built now. It's been built out incrementally. So I think if you go back there next summer, it'll all be finished. And it's quite amazing to see how New Yorkers really uh, overtake and take possession of their public space. So. This is a huge area of granite paving, and everyone thought, well, this is going to be rather uh, sterile, rather boring. Um, but it gets filled with people, filled with life, filled with events. So, uh, so much so that uh, some people think it's beginning to be a problem. So you get in front of the services memorial, you've got uh, all sorts of cartoon characters um, running around. And even worse than that, you've got the naked Brazilian ladies who are coming and um, disturbing the peace down at Times Square. So this project was initiated by uh, the last mayor, uh, Bloomberg, uh, but we have a new mayor now in New York and he's called um, de Blasio and uh, he didn't really feel maybe the same uh, personal attachment to this project since it was his predecessor's project. So he wants to dig the whole damn thing up because there's too many people, there's too much public life, there's too much going on. But I think that's one of the things with public space. You've got to expect that the public come and use it. It becomes messy, a little bit too messy for de Blasio. Luckily, he hasn't dug it up. He hasn't brought the cars back. And uh, the Brazilian dancers are still there, but they've got their little place to, to give me. And the um, naked cowboy is still there. Actually, everyone likes the naked cowboy. He's, um, he's a good friend, and he's a good friend of our architects because they've been down there every day supervising the work. Uh, so he even, um, he even sang a song for them. Well, I'm the naked cowboy here with the snowhead benches. Lero and Tully taking us out of the trenches. So I don't know if there's a naked cowboy here in Moscow, but maybe some of you from Stroker will get him to sing a song for you. And now you can stand in the middle of Times Square on New Year's Day and not get run down. We don't do a lot of, I suppose, urban design projects. And urban design, I think, is a difficult subject, isn't it? Uh, because you try to make perfect cities and cities aren't perfect. So you have to be very pragmatic. This is one of our urban design projects. It's in Honduras City. And the mayor of Honduras City asked us to do something to help the city, something for the urban design. And all around the city are these uh, women who sit on the edge of the street and sell their goods. And they're really in a dangerous place because the cars and the trucks hit them and run them down. So our uh, urban intervention, our urban design for Honduras was to build these concrete benches so that they could sit on the concrete benches and not get hit by the trucks and still sell uh, their tomatoes. So uh, I think urban design can also be very pragmatic. And in an unperfect world, you can do some simple things to make it better. We're still in America, and this is the project where we started our um, office in New York on. It's the, uh, Ground Zero Memorial Center. 
So uh, we haven't designed any of the towers. I just have to tell you that right now. <clears throat> Our building is the small little building in the middle there. So all the way through this project, we sort of uh, had to um, live with that, that all the other architects that we love and know, I am Pei, Frank Gehry, Norman Foster, Calatrava, Marky, they were building all the huge towers around, and we had this little building in the middle, so they were all sort of looking down on us, maybe. Uh, and it's the most uh, complicated site we've ever had to work with. It's the site that's been most in the public eye as anywhere else. Everybody around the world has some idea about what you can do on Ground Zero and what you can't do on Ground Zero. So we've called this project actually design by negotiation rather than design by drawing. We've had to talk to so many stakeholders. The mayor of New York City, the uh, governor of New York State, the Muslims, the Buddhists, the Christians, the Catholics, and the Protestants, everyone has their intention of what you can do here and what you can't do here. So it's the ultimate design dialogue situation. And we're building, uh, we were building on top of a station designed by Santiago Calatrava, which wasn't very easy either because he doesn't like to put any columns into his building, so we didn't really have anywhere to put the building. We had different clients. Uh, some of our clients got kicked off the job because they were uh, wanting to do unpatriotic things on uh, the Ground Zero site. And the building got moved around and shaped by this whole public debate. But there it stands here now. It's uh, fascinating to see people uh, walking around the building. It's the sort of building that people love to uh, stand on the outside and look in, or stand on the inside and look out. See their reflection in the building, see the reflection of New York in the building. Maybe reflect upon the history that lies at the side. In the middle, inside the foyer, we have the two columns, two of the uh, triad columns from the original Twin Towers. Back in Norway, this is our smallest, latest cabin. It's uh, 28 square meters, and it can sleep 23 people. So the owner tells us. Uh, it's in the middle of the mountains. There's no roads here, so everything had to be carried up by horse and everything had to be made by one man and his axe. So every piece of wood is cut by an axe. He did get a little bit of help by the helicopter. Um, so 23 people can sleep with that. I'm not sure. We talk a lot about um, unprogrammed space, and that's really what this building is all about. It's unprogrammed learning space. It's in Toronto, and it's the Ryerson University, and it's the Ryerson University Learning Center. So it's really attached to the library, but it's a place where students come and basically hang out. Um, it's got its entrance straight off the street. Uh, the entrance is uh, like a big canopy. It picks up the light and the reflections of the cars in the street, and you work your way up through the building in different levels. And each of the levels is uh, unprogrammed, so there's no rooms. There's no actual program that goes here. It's just the students themselves that create their own space and create their own uh, program. So uh, in the middle of the building is this one space they call the beach where you uh, hang out and learn. It's nice the way that this building's been taken uh, on board because it's become a public, real public space. And in fact, if you go onto Google Earth on Street View, the Street View will even take you up through the building and you can follow the different spaces inside the building. So the difference between inside and outside is maybe going away. This year we finished this uh, uh, building in France. It's uh, in southwest France and it's a museum for caves. That's a strange thing to have a cave museum. Um, but inside the mountain there they have uh, one of these caves with the prehistoric cave paintings on the walls, and it's so precious that no one's allowed to go inside it anymore because you would destroy the paintings. So our brief was to actually uh, make a new cave. So we um, have scanned in the original cave with a drone, with a 3D scanner. We've made a model of the cave, a 3D model of the cave, and uh, we are now uh, building the actual cave again. 
So we're building a complete copy of the original cave and putting it inside the museum, inside the mountain. So it's a really crazy project. It blurs the boundaries between what's real and what's not real. And of course, we get uh, real cavemen artists to paint the paintings. So the only difference between our cave and the real cave is that our cave is a little bit better because we made it so you could push a wheelchair through it so we get wheelchair access. And they didn't think of that in the old days. I wanted to show you this one because it's the metro station we're doing in uh, Riyadh. And I think in Moscow, uh, you should be able to talk about metro stations. Um, so this the metro station is right in the middle of Riyadh. And it works like this. It works like a periscope. So the lines are like 30 meters down under the ground. They go in across. And the whole canopy is this periscope. It's in polished uh, steel, polished stainless steel, so that when you're on the outside, running towards the metro and you think you're late, you can look into the um, canopy roof and you will see down and you will see the train just leaving because you came too late. Or when you arrive at the station, all the way down at the bottom, you can look up and you can see the whole plaza and the whole city district mirrored in the canopy above you. So you know which station you are, where you are in the city, and you can get some sort of basic wayfinding. So this is the view you'll get if you're running towards it. And if you look into that image, you will see the train, and you will see the train moving. Today it's the biggest hole in, uh, certainly the biggest hole in Riyadh. It's the biggest hole I've ever seen. Uh, I don't quite know what we're doing, but it's now got the uh, tunnel boring machines that are going through. And then underneath this one, is going to be another one. And then finally, we can put up this big polished uh, canopy, maybe two years away. People often ask why we don't do any um, residential projects. Well, this is our latest residential project. It's uh, two beehives for 80,000 bees. So uh, this is where the bees live. Uh, we actually did a project for the man who has a honey shop below, and he wanted to have the beehives above. So these are high-technology beehives. Um, we've actually had an order now for 2,000 of these beehives from someone in Korea who wants to make honey on a big scale. I'm not quite sure what we're going to do about that. Uh, this year, I like, I like Marina Bay Light Festival in Singapore. The theme was uh, sustainability, so we made a place of permanent shade. So in the daytime, this is permanent shade. At the nighttime, it lights up. So this is 1,000 uh, photovoltaic light lamps that collect the sun energy during the daytime and uh, light up at night. So we've now got a new order for a, a, a giant size one of these uh, in South Africa. I'll tell you about that later. The biggest um, wheel in the world in Dubai. Let's jump over that. Oh, this is Busan, the opera house in Korea. Uh, once you've done one opera house, uh, you maybe get to do two. So this is the one we are now doing detail design for in Korea. Uh, it's probably a couple of years away before it's finished. I'm not going to talk about this because I just heard we lost the competition, so goodbye Battersea. But we are building uh, in Paris, and this is the new headquarters for Le Monde, the newspaper, um, at the Gare de l'Austerlitz, that's here. And uh, this is the, the project that they're building now. So they have one side, but you can only build on the two halves of it. So the building has to span across from the one side to the other side. So it becomes this big arch. And of course, because it's the newspaper Le Monde, then all the parts of the building are taken from the, uh, the globe itself, so the curvature of the globe. So they're all uh, curving parts from the globe. And when it's finished, you can sit underneath underneath this big uh, arch and look at all the new news events going on around. I mentioned that we're graphic designers as well as architects. I don't think architecture is so uh, simple as just needing architects. I think we need our graphic designers, we need interior designers, we need landscape designers, we need sociologists, we need artists. We need to meet our clients in a very broad way. We're very happy that we have uh, graphic designers with us now. They change the momentum quite a lot. Their projects come and go quite quickly. And this is one with the, uh, the new banknotes in Norway that are going to come out next year. Um, 
They've also done the uh, credit cards for the uh, major Norwegian bank, which we've turned into fashion. So if you want to dress with a credit card, the most expensive dress in the world, uh, you can get that one. So I uh, really just the banking theme is to take us to the last project I'm going to show you, which is our latest win. So it's always nice to show you something that's coming new. And this is the bank headquarters for the Bank Libano Libanese. Libano uh, Frances in Beirut. So we just heard the other week that we won the competition, so I want to share that with you. It's going to be uh, actually our first um, high-rise. It's not really a high-rise, it's really quite low, but it's the first building that's more than 30 meters high. And it's a series of uh, cutouts in this one big stone volume. Uh, you know, uh, when they approached us first of all to work on this project, we, I got a call from some bank in Beirut who want to build a little headquarters and it sounded very sketchy. Who wants to build a bank in Beirut and how is this gonna work? So, but they turned out to be the most fantastic client. They're really engaged. They wanna build something for their own community, which is the bank, but they wanna build something for the community of uh, Beirut. So we make these cutouts with these gardens and the garden views. We make a big staircase up from the uh, street bringing the people into the building. This is an existing staircase in Beirut. Uh, so we're building a new one through our building, making it a public space. Terraces. Bankers in Lebanon are not like bankers anywhere else. They get the views to the harbor, the views to the mountain. And from the terraces, you can look up, interconnecting, or look down. So the last slide is uh, really the one project we have and we're very proud to have here in Moscow and that's together with Strelka for a little part of this amazing project that uh, you're building for the Garden Ring. And together with uh, the two Dashas, we uh, hope in a year's time I can come back and we have a finished project. Thank you very much. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's me again. Uh, Robert, thank you very much, first of all, and for the whole day you spent with us and for this great lecture. It's really a pleasure for us to have you here. I just have to introduce myself to the audience. I'm a, a director of Strelka Architects, is the office who, uh, with whom uh, Robert is very kind to work and to uh, design a, one uh, territory for the public spaces that we do in Moscow. So we really hope that this will happen and uh, we really hope that next time your presentation will include the slide with this project executed. And I cannot skip the chance somehow to make an open call for the architects. We are looking for the young, talented and kind of strong, able to work hard people to be part of our office. So uh, you can find an application form at Strelka KB uh, Facebook page but you also can come to me later and to talk about a possibility to work in our office. And that's uh, exactly like to be a part of this great project, to bring something like you have seen, like a you know, Times Square project, to be built in Moscow. So this is, was my goal <laughs> to do. And unfortunately, we really run, run out of time, uh, but... Uh, and there is no time for question to you to ask. We have to um, shift the place to the another event that's going to be tonight. But some short amount of question could be asked uh, Robert personal. But please uh, take care about his time. Thank you very much for coming again, and thank you, Robert. Thank you. Дорогие друзья, спасибо, что пришли. Вы можете лично пообщаться с Робертом, если у вас есть к нему вопросы.